those people in the YouTube comments that read the Chromium source code, they the real MVPs, man. Like that's the real shit. <laughs> yeah, just there. leave that in a YouTube comment instead of like tweeting yeah. it or something. Dude, I it's love got that. one like, you know, <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> Yo, how's it going, dude? You look like you just got hit by a train, <laughs> <laughs> dude. I'm so tired. <laughs> for context, you... yeah. yeah. For I'll give a little context here. I did two live hack events back to back, one week and then the other week. So two weeks ago, I was in London with you. We did uh, the Hacker One live hack event. Yeah, talked to Cosman. Then. Yep. I went right from there. I flew to Seoul, South Korea. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and dude. I was there for another week and I did uh, a meta live hacking event. Um, and I participated with Nagley, former uh, podcast guest. And, uh, you know, we found some really cool bugs on there. And uh, then yesterday I flew home. So I am like, my body is screaming at me about time zones yeah. and all that stuff. Uh, Seoul is 16 hours ahead of here and oh London gosh. is eight hours ahead of here. So it was just from like one eight hour time difference into another eight hour time difference and then back to my normal time. Jeez, so I am yeah. uh, I'm <laughs> I'm like half asleep right now. So you'll have to forgive uh, any latency that I've got in my brain. Yeah, no worries, man. I'm sorry I picked such a tricky episode to prep for uh, for when you come back. But yeah, I haven't I haven't seen you this tired looking in a, in a long time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was I was gonna ask you because we haven't really had the chance to catch up either. How was the how was the meta event, dude? Yeah, the meta event was really cool. Uh, we found a zero day. I think that's Whoa, all I can nice, say. Dude. Uh, we found a zero day in an open source piece of software, um, and it ended up in an XSS. I think that's nice. that's about as much as that's, I can say. That's big on Facebook, man. They pay big for those. Yeah, yeah, it was a pretty cool, pretty cool bug. Uh, I was actually very surprised that we were able to find it. Uh, a lot of the people that I talked to there, who are like big time Facebook hackers, were also quite surprised. They said that the Nexus has on Facebook, especially Facebook Core, is something that really, yeah, uh, it's like a once a year type of thing. It really almost never happens. So I was, I was pretty stoked that we found that and that it worked and that it popped and all that. And, yeah, you guys uh, yeah, popped it, it pretty awesome. quick too. I think I saw like the. <laughs> I think I saw Nogli flexing in a hacker chat like like two or three days into the event. And I was like, oh, shit. Yeah, yeah. So shout out to Space Raccoon. Space Raccoon, we also collabed oh, yeah. with uh, oh, yeah. that event. And Space Raccoon had exploited a very similar bug uh, probably within the last year. Um, he, he exploited a very, very similar bug to this. And so when we added him to the group, we were just talking about like the leads and stuff that we were looking at and all that kind of stuff. And I mentioned, I was like, yeah, we have this, uh, we have this potential like zero day, but I've been looking at it. I haven't really uh, gone into like the full details on how to exploit it. And he was like, Oh, I'm pretty sure I know how to exploit this. And in like an hour he popped it and I was like, ah, that's amazing. So that's like the whole, like, I mean, that's like a perfect example of collaboration and how like you can merge like past experience together by like working with other hackers because I, I'm sure we could have exploited it, but it would have taken us significantly more time. And you know, it was just so much easier to bring somebody in who knew what they were doing. And yeah, for sure. And space uh, recruit is also a uh, previous podcast guest. He was, I think, I think he was the first guest we had on the podcast. I, th- I believe he was, yeah. yeah. So definitely, we'll we'll link those episodes down in the description. Um, both Nogli and Space Raccoon, mega good hackers. Su- supreme hackers, yeah. Yeah. How is how are the vibes? Like you know, we've done a lot of Hacker One live hacking events together, you know, and I feel like Hacker One's got it down pat pretty well now. But how are the meta live hacking event vibes? Yeah, so I think it's important to remember that meta. Run, well, Meta runs their own bug bounty program. Yeah. And Meta also isn't a bug bounty company. So for HackerOne, the live hacking events are both a marketing opportunity as well as something that is core to their brand. Right. For Meta, it's a security event. 
You know what right. I mean? It's like a meetup. So for Meta, you know, the, they, the swag and stuff is significantly like less over the top. Like yeah. all the ceremony and stuff is significantly less over the top and all that kind of stuff because all they really care about is like finding cool bugs, paying finding for bugs. those bugs <laughs> and having people yeah. on site and like get, showing them a good time. And for Hacker One, it's like, how do we make this like amazing hacking event experience, right? And so like, mm. I think it's two two very different things. But overall, like the core of the event in terms of like having hackers on site, being able to like talk with all these like amazing people. I got to talk with um, like Yusuf, who's like an amazing Facebook hacker. Yeah, I appreciate dude. he focuses only on on Meta and that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. a lot of the people there who are, are people who like dedicate all their time to hacking on Meta, which is something that I barely spend any time hacking on. So it was like a, a very interesting like perspective shift to get to talk to those people and see like how they approach a platform like meta and the types of stuff that they find and all that kind of stuff and it was really really impressive to see the the, the bugs that people will find so nice dude wow not gonna lie man not gonna lie i'm a little jealous it, it <laughs> sounded like an awesome event i um i had a bachelor party that weekend which was also awesome but nice. uh, you know south korea live hacking event <laughs> <laughs> Sounds pretty freaking lit, man. Yeah, Seoul was a very cool place. I'd never been to South Korea, so that was yeah, you had uh, that a decent was an awesome amount of time experience. there too, right? Yeah, yeah, we took uh, we did a, a day or two ahead and a day or two after as well, mm -hmm. just to like get to see sites and explore and go shopping and, and experience the the country and the city. So uh, yeah, I definitely would recommend going to South Korea. It's it's an amazing place, and you should experience it for yourself. Nice, man. Well. Joel, you're you're six minutes in. You're still alive, so <laughs> I <laughs> hopefully you won't fall asleep as we talk about all the mega technical stuff we're going to talk about today. Because unlike some of the past episodes that we've had, um, this one is going to be like pretty in the freaking weeds. So um, yeah, yeah. I was just mentioning. I I sent you a message like five minutes before we started that this whole episode could be a news episode because yeah, of the There's amount of so like news. news and links and new very relevant stuff that's happened in the last like week or two um around this topic being you know like browser quirks and behaviors and yeah. restrictions and that kind of stuff yeah yeah there's been a bunch and uh and yeah i i i messaged joel and i was like hey man you might want to like you know <laughs> allocate a little extra prep time for this episode and i'm sure he was like you know laying in bed trying to get every last little bit of sleep but i was like literally adding stuff to this episode up until the last minute so sorry if you didn't get the chance to review all of it i i you know there's some grace i know you're coming right back from the from the live hacking event so um yeah i guess we'll just kind of hop into it um the first one that i want to talk about i don't know if you saw this one but um it's titled hunting so new stuff right this is uh hunting for nginx alias traversals in the wild this was released just yesterday um, by, I don't know how to pronounce, like, I want to pronounce this Hawkeye Labs, but I'm not sure if that's exactly how you pronounce it. Um, but dude, this is just such a beautiful example of like taking research and then applying it and just popping crazy bugs, right? Like this, this research has been out here. This Nginx, um, research was released by Orange in Black Hat 2018. This is five-year-old research, right? And then, you know, if you read through the blog post, homie's just like, okay, well, let's apply this. So he goes to GitHub search and just writes a regex and then <laughs> pops like multiple bounties with it. And I'm just like, what a G. Yeah. Yeah. So I was talking with, with Nagli a lot. We were hanging a lot yeah. out a lot while well, on, on this whole trip. And I yeah. think this is like a perfect use case for Nuclei, right? Where, yeah. Like, this is probably something that doesn't exist in a rule already. Maybe it does, right? But I mean, if it, if it did, it probably would have been found by more things. Yeah. But if you see research like this, like some, like if you were to have noticed like Orange's blog post back in 2018 mm -hmm. or their presentation back in 2018, yeah, that would be a great use case for something that you can get a, an advantage on or an edge against everybody else by turning that into a query, putting it into your own nuclei setup, and then running it across all the targets that you're monitoring. And then using that to your advantage as sort of, you know, nobody like it's out there, but it's not out there. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, for sure. And and I, I, I think that's true. And I think there's I, I've actually personally done some scanning for this for this exact vulnerability. Um, 
But I think what's really interesting about the way that this guy, you know, applied it was he, you know, went after open source stuff with this, um, which I think is really smart because by nature of this, um, and I know we we actually haven't said which which research we're talking about. This is the uh, uh, off by off by a slash research um, by uh, by Orange in 2018. So essentially, if you have a nginx location defined, and the location does not have a slash at the end, and then the alias that it's pointing to, or the or the um, I think there's one other one. Well, yeah, if the alias that it's pointing to does not have a slash at the end. Um, you can actually, res it can actually result in a path traversal. Um, I think it's the other way. Actually, it has the so. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So the, the location doesn't have a slash, but the alias does have a slash, and then that makes it vulnerable. The location does have. <laughs> Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold yeah. on, hold on. For, so, so it says for the technique to be applicable, the following conditions must be met: the location directive should not have a trailing slash in its path. And right. an alias directive must be present with the location context, and it must end with a slash. Right, right. Because that slash is what's getting passed through. Right. Okay, gotcha. Okay, yeah. So, um, and then, <laughs> thanks for clearing that up, man. I love how, <laughs> like, your brain operating at 50% <laughs> still, like, you know. No, um, that's hey, At man. least I can still read. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've got that going for me. <laughs> you, got, you got that one on me, Joel. <laughs> um, no, yeah, so... Uh, and, and I, like I said before, I'd actually played around with this specific vuln and I wrote my own sort of um, nuclei module for this. It's not nuclei, it was my own custom thing. But um, I think the open source approach is really, really smart because um, by nature of this vulnerability, you only have one path traversal, right? You only get to go up one directory level. And so you kind of got to know what is in that directory in order to be able to fully exploit this vulnerability. And so um, in the in the... In the uh, blog post, he talks about um, exploiting this against Bitwarden, uh, self-hosted Bitwarden, and uh, and it resulting in the database um, being leaked, uh, <laughs> which is like a big L. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bitwarden's a password manager, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's that's great. And he, he said that they they um, fix the issue and give it the max bounty for their broke bounty program. So love to see nice. that. And then I think they also found something similar on Google. Um, Seems like that one got a little bit less rewarded, but um, it it definitely seems like yeah, it's it, only five hundred bucks for that. It, it seems like that should have a bit more, but I'm, maybe there were some mitigating factors. But yeah, Either yeah, way, I'm sure that, that that there were. I feel like, uh, I, and this is a little little bit of a tangent, but mm -hmm. having looked at like the Facebook and Microsoft and Google programs a little bit now, yeah, yeah. it's really crazy how much money they pay i mean we're talking like for perspective here zoom probably the second most high paying program would be my guess on hacker one mm. public program they have paid i think like seven or eight million total mm. number one i think they paid 14 12 mm. or 14 million mm -hmm. google and facebook and microsoft i believe all paid at least one million dollars last year alone wow dang yeah. dude and that's without running live events. Wow, that's some serious. That's some serious output. Yeah, it. I mean, it's it's kind of crazy. Um, and I think part of that is that like some of the bugs they pay for are very very high bugs. So I know like Google had this one bug that they paid like over a half a million for. It was like a no really bad way. pixel bug. Um, wow. And like you know, some of the hackers at, at the Facebook event, for example, like Yusuf. He walked away with like a couple hundred K by himself. Yeah. Yeah. So he posted about you know, that on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. So like definitely there are some like high earners and stuff and some some categories. But I think it's important to realize that even like some of the largest programs on Hacker One are kind of dwarfed by these mega companies who are doing their own programs. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's really wild. Like generally speaking like if they're paying low it's because they, it's like there's some like crazy crazy confounding factor because they're gotcha. pretty they're pretty liquid and they like yeah. to pay bounties <laughs> pretty yeah. pretty liquid i like that <laughs> yeah. yeah i always i look for the programs that are really liquid if you know what yeah. i'm talking yeah. about <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so um 
But yeah, I just wanted to highlight this one because I thought this was a really cool application and just encouraging that like you can go find old research that, you know, has been around for a while and, you know, go and apply it, write your own tool, write your own way to look, to come up with your own way for, to look for it. And uh, it will it could result in some really cool bugs. Yeah. Well, and I also like that uh, in this blog, like the first thing that they tried was just using a GitHub code search, which is yeah. a super accessible way to search for yeah, stuff because... For sure. It's open, it's free, it's available. You can just literally go to cs.github.com and yeah. you know, go ahead and, and search for your regex that's going to find the vulnerabilities and, and make you money right out of the bat, bat. You don't even have to spin up a special tool or anything like that. So, And, and does code search, I know that they just re pushed this out not too long ago. I can't guess I can't say just recently. Does it have 100% indexing now or no? That I'm not sure about. I know that it was limited in the beginning. Yeah, um, I think they probably expanded it all the way now. Yeah, but Sourcegraph, which is like probably the, yeah. the, the main competitor, or I guess code, code Search is probably the competitor to Sourcegraph because Sourcegraph right. the kit was there first. But uh, Sourcegraph, you could always spin up your own Sourcegraph instance as well. And then mm -hmm. you can tell it to index you know, a bunch of repos or you can tell it to index like... I don't think you can have it index like all of GitHub. <laughs> just yeah, because. that would be pretty intense. <laughs> yeah, but if you have like... A list of organizations right so if you take a list of public hmm. bug bounty programs yeah. go get their github organization names put them in a list index all of their repos that would probably be a good strategy yeah no totally agree there um next on the list is this another banger from portswigger research I, I have to say i really appreciate that account man like that's they, they really put out some good stuff um and this the tweet that i'm talking about is the one regarding um popovers uh, which is a new feature in Chrome. And, you know, just as they, as Chrome releases it, Portswigger Research finds a way to pop something with it. Um, and essentially, there's a new way to trigger XSS on uh, any, any, um, I think it's any element. Yeah, right? any tag. Yeah, that's what I was, I was trying to come up with arbitrary. Yeah, or any yeah, arbitrary not, tag. It doesn't even have to be an element, right? It's, it's just any tag. Yeah, yeah. So um, that's really cool to see. Um, and then it was also really cool to see the surrounding research on that too, that kind of everyone like Cure53 commented on it. Um, I don't know how to pronounce this guy's name. Erstel, Erstel commented on it yeah. with some really yes, sort of, yeah, uh, sort of brain boggling stuff. Um, so yeah, that's definitely a, a cool technique to be on the lookout for. I'm not sure how often like this will be useful uh, as opposed to a different XSS vector, um, maybe like helpful for bypassing some WAFs and stuff like that, but um, still something cool to be aware of nonetheless. Yeah, so I when I was looking at it, I think it it's like at minimum one click, right? Or two yeah. clicks. Yeah, yeah, one click. So yeah. there's definitely some, some confounding factors here that it's going to lower the impact a little bit depending on how the company looks at it. Like some companies might just say any XSS is valuable to us even if it's two click. Maybe mm. you can also craft a POC that would make it plausible, kind of like a click jacking yeah. type of thing where you can, yeah. you know, create a scenario that would make sense for the user to be clicking twice or something like that. Um, but even still, I, I, I think like, over the last couple of months, we've seen a lot of things get removed from Chrome and a lot of uh, changes that have made things more secure. And it's been almost almost disheartening as a bug bounty hunter to see the, all these XSS vectors disappear. And uh, they're looking out for us. They're they're adding yeah. new XSS vectors for us. Yeah. It's nice. Warms Thank the you. Heart, doesn't it? Just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The internet's becoming more vulnerable. <laughs> so just what I thought that I was going to have to stop filing these bugs. Now <laughs> there are new methods. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and I think it's also really cool that it triggers, it's sort of a multi-element sort of thing, right? Because there's like the button that you click on and then there's this custom attribute pop over target and then you provide the ID for a different element and then it triggers something on that element. And uh, as Cure53 pointed out, that element can even be hidden or um, disabled, uh, right? Uh, disabled, yeah. yeah. Which I think is is really cool as well because there are some fringe circumstances and, and you, we, we really get down in the weeds um, you know, with some of these technicalities sometimes. But when you have all of these things floating around in your head, as you see these scenarios pop up uh, over time when you're hunting, um, it's, really, it's really great when you can use some really fringe research to pop a bug. Um, and that's how you avoid dupes as well because not a lot of people are, are on top of this stuff. Yeah, you know, the first thing that popped into my mind about the hidden value thing 
is yeah. a pattern that I see a lot in what in web, which is that there'll be either like a state or maybe a token or something in the URL parameters, mm -hmm. and that'll get reflected into an HTML form in yeah. it, for like submission. Like it'll be like a token, and then you'll click a button in the page, and it'll submit that value again. Yeah, and I think if you could find obviously you need kind of a second injection point to make it so that you can trigger the, the, the popover target. But if you can inject this even into a hidden form element, right, then mm -hmm. you can take advantage of that XSS. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And that's a good, that's a good XSS tip in general is that, and you, and you can even work backwards from it, right? Like if you're trying to figure out what query parameters could go into uh, you know, could be used in this specific page. You can go into the source, look at the hidden input parameters, right? And and see what the name or ID of those are, and then try those in the URL. Um, and that may allow you to set some malicious defaults um, by a URL parameter if it's reflected down in there, or um, might even allow you to get XSS. So yeah, yeah, for sure. So yeah. definitely check out like the quote tweets and stuff on that Port Swigger research. And yeah, also just set your tweet alerts up for Port Swigger Research because yeah. I don't think there's ever been a tweet that they've made <laughs> that's been like, ah, oh, this is not a good tweet. <laughs> but like, yeah, I feel like every time, <laughs> every single thing that they push out is is very like high quality yeah. research. Just generally speaking, we've also talked about the Port Swigger Web Academy stuff, which is also really high quality. Yeah, it's always like very on the front edge of like what's actually exploitable and all that kind of stuff, and and good for for training and getting new people like accustomed to exploiting XSS and other web web vulnerabilities. So. Um, definitely yeah. go check that that out. Check out their account and their website. For sure. Um, okay, so before we move on from this section, check out the tweet by Sarush um, Erstel. This is yep. this is really this is really interesting to me. I was like kind of looking at this for a while before I could figure out what the heck was going on here, and it this is not even really like anything crazy to do with the popover target thing. The thing that's really crazy for me with this is that he uses two equal signs after popover target, right? So the 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 code we're talking about here is is button space popover target equals equals and then it's a double quote, right? So he's mm -hmm. defining an attribute, but this attribute is not using the double quote as the beginning of the attribute like you would normally see in HTML. It's actually using two equal signs. So the first equal sign defines the attribute and the second equal sign is just a content of the attribute. Right. Yeah. And then that inside of that content of the attribute is a double quote. Right. Yeah. I think this is really, really nifty. And I think you can use this in a bunch of different situations for WAF bypasses or XSS filter bypasses, because um, I imagine that there will be a regex that is looking specifically when it's parsing HTML attributes, looking specifically for that for that. Um, for that equal sign and then double quote. Right. So if you have right. two equal signs, that might continue the regex and it will assume that the double quote is the beginning of the attribute but actually the e the second equal sign is the beginning of the attribute which i think i think that was really cool i hadn't seen that technique before yeah i didn't i didn't really realize like this was possible and mm -hmm. it yeah reading it it's very confusing to understand like what's yeah. actually going on here it, i am i correct that it's using the equals as the val like the value of the attribute so yeah. like basically your popover target is something that's called like equals yeah yeah it looks like it yeah and so you see look at the id down there it's a so if you look at input right the input tag the id for that is equals equals equals, equals quote equals. Yeah. you know uh less than bang dash dash right and that matches the popover target from above which looks like an html comment to a parser right. but actually this is this is just a part of the the attribute because of the way it's set up. So really yeah. really cool um, stuff there, and I think cross applicable in a lot of other XSS scenarios. Yeah, I have a feeling this will probably come up with uh, some some like third party XS or HTML parsers and stuff oh, yeah. that are going to be checking for XSS by parsing the HTML elements, just like you said, and uh, we'll be handling that incorrectly because it's going to look like an HTML comment in there or something like that, or it might not one-to-one -one mm -hmm. meet the spec yep. and they might just like have like a one character slip up and that's all it takes yeah for sure so definitely it, this one's a little bit easier to to see than to hear about so definitely check out this one we'll link it in the description yeah um all right so speaking of cool xss stuff um we have another one here which was kind of surprising to me um uh, the RCE man, <laughs> ironically, <having> a <laughs> client side bug, um, uh, tweeted this out. And 
he said, don't forget about the magical math element, which can make any HTML element clickable within the Firefox browser. And so he defines a math element, and then inside of that defines an XSS tag, just a you know less than XSS space, you know, defines that tag, and and uh, sets the href to that to a JavaScript href, and you click on that and it triggers in uh, in Firefox, which. Uh, and I tried to figure out why this is. Like, what is it about the math tag that makes it makes everything clickable? And I, I couldn't figure it out. So it, it it seems like this is just one of those weird quirks. It might help to know in some fringe circumstances. Yeah, it's it's super super weird. Um, and I will add a little caveat here. Um, mm. Firefox. I, I think like in tech, a lot of people use Firefox and like. Uh, it's it's an easy misconception to think that Firefox is probably one of the largest browsers out there. However, <laughs> if you look up the browser market share stats, the top oh, wait, browser wait, hold is on, Chrome. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me guess. I want to say it's like I want to say it's around twelve percent. Twelve percent Firefox. Yeah, I, I don't. No, I don't know. Not it, even close. <laughs> what? Really? Not even close. Yeah, no, 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 not even close. Okay, so it's like sixty percent Chrome, right. twenty to twenty five percent Safari, and Firefox is at about. Two and a half percent. No way. Really? Yeah, it's yeah, it's underneath wow. edge, right? So like well, out of the under box. Edge? It, yeah. Oh my god. Under edge. So like the reality is that like the majority of people who are using a computer are using the built-in browser or mm -hmm. or Chrome just because of its right. dominance in the market. So like Chrome, obviously number one by a long shot, but then it's Safari and Edge as the two next browsers, because those are the ones that are built into Mac and Windows. Wow, dude, that is definitely surprising to me. And I will say though, um, I feel like Edge is going to gain some popularity back because you can only use Bing, uh, like search AI stuff in Edge. I tried to do it in Chrome the <laughs> other day, and it was like, no, 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 go to Edge. And I'm like, that's true. what that's is true wrong with I, you? Like, I launched stop. Edge like for the first time in probably five years because I wanted to use the Bing AI to search for something. <laughs> exactly, man. So I don't know. I. I you know, Microsoft is really leaning into trying to claw back some of that, you know, browser real estate. Um, but I don't know. And it, this may, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if this pulled a percent or two away from them. And at the end of the day, it is using Chromium, you know, as a base now. So, you know, may not be too bad. Who knows? Yeah, it might not be too bad. I think like the biggest thing is just like how integrated Chrome is with yeah. your accounts and just extensions and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. Um, dude, we just have so much XSS stuff today. So many weird, yeah, yeah. We, <laughs> I feel like HTML parsers are really taking a beating this week. Yeah. Um, so the next one that's on the list, and I, I linked a YouTube video in the notes, like a genius. Um, <laughs> but it, this is this is uh, the YouTube video is live overflows um, summary, and we'll link this in the description, of course. Is live overflows. Um, summary of some research that he he did based off of a weird tweet he saw. And I've actually seen him do this a couple times where he like sees some weird tweet and he's like, oh, that's kind of odd. I bet that has security implications. And then he like creates a video of him like sussing that out. And I think that's gold, right? Like if anybody is trying to, you know, this isn't a particularly beginners oriented podcast, but if there are, you know, beginners out there trying to learn how to, you know, up your research game, that is a great example of of what to do and what the pros do when when trying to you know uh, conduct some security research. So definitely check out Live Overflow's video. In this one, he's talking about a tweet that he saw where it said there's something weird about the um, less than and then number uh, tags, right? Because uh, numbers aren't valid HTML tags, and yeah. somehow um, the first. So if you have an open tag, it gets HTML encoded because it's not a valid thing. But if you have a closed tag, it gets stuck inside of a comment, right? right? So it's like, yeah, oh, this is kind of weird. Um, so he kind of goes through there and comes up with this way to like this this theory that he's got that this is going to bypass a bunch of HTML sanitizers, and then he goes and puts them in the HTML sanitizers, and nah, you know, people have known about this for a long time. <laughs> um, but it was a really cool exercise in how to research some quirky behavior. So I figured I'd give it a shout out anyway. Yeah, yeah, and Lupin uh, had a follow up Dude. about, you know, about this this weird behavior, um, and they were talking about in a video that this might be an interesting way to bypass a WAF, and then somebody had left a comment linking to the source code in right. the Chromium engine, like where this 
parsing actually happens and like what what it's looking for in terms of like a comment tag and it was super super interesting to see you know the kind of quirks that you can do because of this sort of edge case behavior where it's like a closing tag with a number in it that gets then converted into something else yeah yeah for sure man i love the you know those people in the youtube comments that read the chromium source code they the real mvps man like that's the real shit <laughs> yeah just there. leave that at a youtube comment instead of like tweeting yeah. it or something dude i it's love got that. one like you know it's crazy <laughs> <laughs> legendary like what an absolute legend right um so yeah like you said really awesome stuff there i actually double clicked into the uh the google chromium um source code and yeah it was really cool about and this is the comment specifically was it wasn't about the um the numbers like i was talking about before this was about the question mark um and so if you put a question mark in so you do less than sign question mark right this is no html encoding here this is just raw you know no entities or anything um, then that actually gets converted into a comment, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and I, I, in a little bit later in the episode today, if we don't talk our, you know, talk to the end of the episode about news stuff, we're, I'm going to talk about, um, some other cool ways to do job comments in JavaScript. But, um, this is a really interesting one that, uh, kind of like, I didn't, I didn't realize you could trigger an HTML comment this way. Um. And, you know, who knows when this stuff is going to be useful. Maybe there's a scenario yeah. when you really need to comment something out and uh, and you can't do it because, uh, you know, the, the stuff is sanitized. Or maybe, like, you can't put a... Maybe it needs to be, like, URL... Compa oh, this is actually a, a viable scenario. Um, like, if you have, like, for some reason, it doesn't want you to have a uh, bang in the URL. I've mm. seen that before. and uh, But you can have the question mark. So, so right. that could be a cool way to smuggle in a HTML comment without... Um, without using the bang. Yeah. And we also showed like, you know, with this other XSS vector that just came out, like mm -hmm. you can do some weird stuff with an HTML comment, like in the tag as, as like part of the ID or yeah. part of the attribute. Right. Yeah. So you could potentially combine the, all these things together and chain it into one crazy bug that uh, bypasses a lot of WAFs or bypasses you know, everything. <laughs> yeah. Bypasses everything. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Even the HTML parser. <laughs> the, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. The HTML yeah. parser is like, what? I, the I can frick sense is this? a DOM purify bypass coming. Yeah, it, right? It's it's like right on. Uh, yeah, next it's, week or something. It's funny, dude. The the live overflow video. He he's like, ah, you know, I'm gonna go straight for the for the super boss DOM purify, right? And DOM purify yeah. is like, nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Check. Yeah. Been there, done that. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, no, that that piece of software is pretty freaking solid. It would be it would be really cool to get a bypass in that though. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you saw um, Mr. Tux Racer. He uh, he had tweeted out going go, going on to the next thing. Uh, yeah. Mr. Tux Racer had tweeted out uh, a couple days ago. I think he said, you know, would there be any interest in a blog post about patch diffing? Yeah. I've been doing a lot of patch diffing lately, and it seems like something that might be an interesting topic. Like, let me know. And so people replied and said, yeah, yeah, for sure. And Yesterday, uh, he published a post on his blog, rcesecurity.com, that goes into how he patch diffed a CVE in WooCommerce and mm. actually exploited it on a target. Um, and so this, I think, is a great case study about sort of how to approach these types of things. Patch diffing is like a great way to find sort of hidden attack surfaces, those like end day, one day, two day type yeah. vulnerabilities that exist. Maybe they've been talked about in like release notes or something, but you haven't ever seen a public blog detailing what the actual vulnerability is or there's no POC. And again, this is like a great way to get that edge against like the other hackers, especially if you're a full-time hacker uh, or you're just looking for some new attack surface, keeping your finger on the pulse. Like now, anytime you see WooCommerce, you're going to be like, hang on a sec, I, there's, there's a bug for that. Um, I'm not sure how exactly he found initially the like, the post i guess there was just a security advisor he said he mar like just mentioned like that there was a uh there he noticed there was a uh, uh an advisory published on WordFence mm -hmm. for this uh this bypass and if you look it up it's got the cv is like a 9.8 critical so Jeez. i think that would probably catch most people's attention woocommerce i think is also pretty pretty common it's, it's pretty pretty widely dude. used yeah yeah um so he, he went he got the source he Diffed it against the old version, sure enough, figured out how to exploit it, and it's 
it's, it's crazy it's just like one header right so it's simple <laughs> dude x wc pay platform checkout user equals one and uh with that header you can create new users and set them as an admin and just escalate immediately to to wordpress account admin it's uh, it's super super wild Dude, yeah, I I read this blog post and I was like, you know, I, I know that I know that Julian um does a decent amount of like WordPress related stuff, which I think is cool because not a lot of people do. Because uh, I don't know, I, I don't, I really honestly don't know why people don't go after it more. Core WordPress core is really solid. Like if you can yeah. find a bug in WordPress core, you're pretty much you know you're set because <laughs> that's like seventy percent yeah. of the internet or whatever. But um the plugins are pretty whack. Um, and you can enumerate the plugins um, really easily. Um, so yeah. it's uh, there's, there's a lot of scope there um, if you're willing to do some source code review. And this one, you can see just how well this paid off. Um, yeah. Just a real, I mean, and, and this is a good case study as well of like how patch shifting doesn't have to be super mega hard. Like, I mean, he literally just diffed it and he was like, there's like three things different about this yeah. specific commit. And, uh, and then, you know, he dives in and it's literally just like add a header and it just destroys everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So. I think for me, like what a lot of the reasons why I've like not d exploited something on WordPress is there's like two main reasons. One is that it's really hard to get the plugin source code without paying for it or like doing some jumping through a lot of hoops to like get your hands on the actual plugin which we've talked about it, like pay for stuff, you'll get an advantage generally speaking, but that can also be risky depending on how, how much the plugin costs. The other side of it is that uh, there's a really common WordPress plugin like scanner thing uh, yeah. tool. I, I can't, I can't remember scan. the name. Like, yeah, WP scan, yep. And that generally just looks for like public vulnerabilities that are mm. like, it, are known to be exploitable. And so if it's not showing up in there, then you may not know to even look for it and you may mm. not, dive any deeper than that you might just see oh it's got these plugins okay move on and so going that extra step and getting your hands on the plugin code patching patch diffing it against a known vulnerability or something like that yeah and then exploiting it you know it it, it takes a little bit of extra effort but i, I think it's generally going to be worth it yeah so so I, I think that the piece about the getting your hands on the plugin code that can be true if it's a pay-to-play plugin but like in my, I've actually had a lot of luck with just going to word, you know, WordPress.org slash plugins and finding the plugin and then just mm. pressing the download button, downloading mm. as a zip and you get the source code, right? Um, and I think, I think um, I'm not sure if he did it this way in the actual, yeah, it looks like he actually diffed it inside of like his own local machine or whatever. So you you could go and download the various older versions of it and then diff it. But uh, sometimes they even have like GitHub repos with the full source in there and various, you know, commits yeah. and stuff like that which would make it even much easier so yeah i think sure. it, i think um if anybody really wants to try to do some um source code review related stuff it would be really cool to kind of go to uh just go at look at the top wordpress plugin maybe like scroll down like three or four pages right like get to get to the ones that are not like the mega mega wordpress plugins but like the semi mega you know popular wordpress plugins and then just do a security assessment of those and if you can pop one that's got you know like this one has six hundred thousand plus active uh installations i'm sure you'll be able to make some money off of that uh, on a bug uh, you know, somewhere in bug bounty. Yeah. And I believe specifically this, this was in WooCommerce payments, right? So, yeah. so that's where it's like a little weird, right? Like if you look at the top commercial plugins on WordPress, the third top commercial plugin is WooCommerce, not wow. WooCommerce payments, <clears throat> the WooCommerce. WooCommerce has 5 million active installations over 5 million, whereas WooCommerce wow. payments is 600,000 plus. So it's just like little things like that, right? Like, but I also think there's probably some really interesting research if you were to do a deep dive source code review on all of those top plugins in general. I am sure that they're not all up buttoned up nicely and up to security spec. There's there's got to be some zero days in there. Uh, oh, yeah. I, 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 I can feel it. For sure. And actually, that's a really cool pattern, actually, Joel, that you mentioned is that's like a, a supplemental plugin to a mega, mega, mega popular plugin, right? right? So WooCommerce is like, like you said, top, top five, you know, uh, most popular top three, plugins. Yeah, yeah top, top three. Um, and, and so, you know, maybe like a, 
a plugin that sort of integrates with that or like, you know, connects up with that, that, that could be a really good way to find a plugins that are a little bit less security tested, but also have a lot of widespread use. Right. And the same sort of impact, right? Like if you can find like escalate from that secondary plugin into a main plugin, because it's used as a dependency that, you know, it's not, it may not have the same amount of scrutiny and the same amount of security mm. checks and stuff like you said. Yeah, no, that's good stuff, man. Good, uh, good, good tips. I, I might actually check that out myself. Um, Okay, dude, we still got two more news so items we still got, to go. We're, we're almost we, through the well, news. In, in our defense, we haven't done news in a little while because, you know, last episode was with Cosmin. So, yep. um, yeah. <laughs> oh, and then the one before that was with uh, was with Rezo and, and Daniel. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, dude, we haven't done news in a while. Okay, all right. True. We're just catching up on some news. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we talked about this with the CBSS4. Yeah, I don't know if we... Did we talk about I, yeah. it in person at the I'm live action sure event? I'm pretty sure we talked about it in person because uh, Ram yeah. Sexy yeah. W- uh, noticed that in the CBSS4 draft, they had made some changes. I, and I, I recall this was while we were in London. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. Like Ram Sexy just like tweeted yeah. this out. Um, so back June 21st, Ram Sexy, uh, uh, Pierre-Luc uh, yeah. tweeted out that there were changes in the CBSS4 draft spec that it said specifically under the privileges required section that self-service provision accounts that may be necessary to attack a cloud service do not constitute a privilege requirement if the attacker can grant themselves permission these permissions as part of the attack. And this feels fairly straightforward. <laughs> like, this feels logical. <laughs> like, that feels like how it should be. That, that feels like it shouldn't need explanation or need to be explicitly written. But if you look at how CBSS 3 is scored... That is not the case. Uh, oftentimes, having to create your own account does count as privileges required. So, like, even though you could just go self-register and give yourself these perms, for some reason in CBSS three, it gets graded as, oh, you need privileges to do that instead of just being like a completely unauth, like you know, w- which is like I get it, like that's that's the worst case scenario. But when the <laughs> when the worst, like when when the next step is having to walk through an open doorway like yeah, that's not yeah. i don't really count that as like having to pick a lock you know what i mean totally. it's like wow yeah. dude you just you just made like a pretty good analogy on air on the fly amazing yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i mean i don't like, know I, like maybe that's my own weakness but like i just can't do analogies on the fly like that like you know what? <laughs> that gets a that gets a slow clap for thank you too thank you thank you thank you thank you I am um, half asleep still. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, like, yeah. dude, you're killing it today. I mean, I couldn't even tell. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And and it's kind of a shame that CVSS 3 and 3.1 didn't address this a little bit earlier because it would have saved a lot of bug bounty hunters a lot of money. Um, but or I was made glad them a lot to, of money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I was glad to see CVSS 4 did have that. But here's the thing. So go to that tweet. Click the quotes, man. <sighs> yep, a couple days ago, yesterday, um, somebody somebody tweeted out. So apparently, and I actually went and I, ch- I checked this because I, w- I was like, oh, maybe it's just like a bug. Nope, indeed, they removed it, at least in the current draft spec for CVSS4. They have removed that sentence from the privileges required uh, section. It's just, it disappeared like a week after <laughs> Ram Sexy tweeted that out. And... Uh, who knows? Maybe maybe somebody just like hit the lead on the wrong commit. I don't know. I don't know. It's um. So I think it'll be interesting to see what happens. I know a lot of people are pinging them on Twitter, being like, "What's going on? Like, why did they change this?" So I I don't think they've they've actually said anything yet as to what the reason was for removing that from the draft spec. But I'm sure that, that people will demand some sort of an answer. So it'll be good to see. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to use the the power of the critical thinking audience real quickly here. <laughs> like I'm going to put, we're going to put this tweet um, by Reef BR in the, in the description. Okay. We need to go to this tweet and we need to tag the freaking um, first, first.org, you know, Twitter account and be like, what the heck is going on? Because this is gonna, this is like taking money right out of our pockets here. Right. And, um, and yeah, I would really like them to put that sentence back someone made a joke i think in the comments that was like this is this is big bug bounty lobbying for like you know changes in the in the spec um 
but yeah, I would really like, like an explanation at least um, about why that decision was made. Uh, and hopefully we can get it reverted. Yeah. Yeah. I'm about, <laughs> I'm actually quote tweeting them now. Go, I'm going, what's up with this at first.org. Thinking yeah. emoji. <laughs> yeah. We, we absolutely need to do that. So we should, I think, I don't think that tweet even Yeah, So Pierre Luke's um, tweet got like a bunch of interaction uh, on it, like 230 likes or something like that. And a bunch of retweets. And then this yeah. other guy like has only got like 22 likes or whatever and retweets. Yeah. And this is the one that needs to be like smacked upon, you know? Yeah. A hundred percent. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we get some clarification from purse.org soon. It's also really funny because like there are so many familiar names in the, in the replies on the Ram sexy mm. tweet, just like celebrating the change. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Then, and I don't, I don't know how many of them have, have realized that they they're getting bamboozled here. So. Yeah. We need to go into that original thread and like ping all the people and be like, look at this, look at this. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. Cool. Party man. The last, last and thing. final news entry for today um, is and we saved the best for last, not going to lie. Yeah. You know, a, a Tom Nom Nom tool, that's like mega Ugh. bug bounty news right there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So Tom uh, Tom has not actually been putting out a bunch of tools lately, um, but he drops this one on us, which is which is great. Uh, and I think I think it's pronounced J. Sluice. J. S. Yes. Sluice. Yeah, Jay Sluice. <laughs> Jay Sluice. Yeah. I, I, dude, yeah. before this episode, I went on online and like tried to find a video of someone talking about it, so I could like, I don't know, I, I, I just I give up. Yeah, so know? Tom Nom Nom actually tweeted about like the the way to, oh, to pronounce really? this. Oh, yeah, my yeah. Gosh. So let me find the exact tweet. But dude, I freaking love Tom that he would do yes. that, man. So uh, somebody, yes. So so he tweeted out like. That he had announced a new tool at b-sides leads in the uk it's called j sluice um basically what it does is it takes in like a giant string of javascript and it will parse it out and it will do a bunch of heuristics and ast and that kind of stuff to identify all the urls and paths and secrets within it and output that to you and somebody actually replied and was like this is awesome but how do i pronounce the name and so he replied j dash sluice s-l-o-o-s-e j sluice so nice. uh, i think sluice is like uh like a, a term for something it's sluice is a uh, an act of rinsing or showering with water I, I think i don't know this might be a uk term or something because yeah, uh, i was like familiar with it but yeah he commented under another one too and he says it's named after sluice box a thing you ah. use to find gold so I guess that's oh, like the little sifty ah, thing that you use yeah, the to little, like yeah when you're panning for gold. Yep. Nice, nice. Okay. Cool. Solid. That makes a lot more sense. But yeah, yeah. So the tool is really cool. Um, it it does something which I think has been needed, um, in the industry for a while, which is it helps us to extract URLs from uh, JS files. And there are some really cool tools out there. I think the one I think Link Finder is it by um. Yeah, dude, I was trying to remember what it was because it, w it was actually crazy timing. A couple days yeah. before this came out, I was talking with somebody in person at the at the live hacking event. And I was like, yeah, isn't there some tool that like parses the JavaScript and it pulls out the, the string constants and like looks for URL paths or something like that. And this is basically exactly that, but better. Um, yeah. So yeah, for, for some context, like for those who don't know, uh, Tom Nom Nom is like an incredible bug bounty hunter. He Amazing. was a bug bounty hunter for many, many years. Uh, one of the OGs I would I would consider. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, a couple of years ago, he left and he started working at Bishop Fox as mm -hmm. uh, doing like security tooling and that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. And um, he's been a little bit quiet since then. I'd imagine just because he's been, uh, you know, building cool, cool stuff like this. Yeah, right. Exactly. And, uh, and yeah, here, here we go. This is an awesome, awesome tool to see from Tom Nom Nom. Awesome to see uh, that he's still doing, you know, that kind of like the security and the bug bounty type stuff. And this is going to be an awesome contribution to the bug bounty community because this is such an amazing tool that's useful for parsing the JavaScript instead of having to like dig through a million lines of obfuscated minified JavaScript. You can just, throw it through, through JSluice and see what it outputs. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so uh, unlike Link Finder, which is what I had been currently using up until this point, as, as well as just my own set of regexes, this actually uses um, Go Tree Sitter, which is, I guess, a library which allows you to parse mm -hmm. sort of syntaxical grammars uh, a little bit easier, right? 
And, um, and it, it uses that in order to parse out the whole JS file and do a little bit more intelligent matching on what sort of, um, so what sort of lines or what sort of uh, variable assignments and stuff like that are going to be resulting in a URL being formed and then you know passing that back to you with a little bit more information. So um, I really like that because it does take that little bit out that I would have to do with a different tool of like going back to finding the JS source code and then reading it and being like, oh, you know, ah, it truncated this you know URL parameter that I really need or something like that. Um, and it and it and it kind of makes it a little bit more cohesive and put together, which is really cool. Yeah, yeah, super cool. I mean, Tom Ramon is like an amazing. Uh, I mean, his brain is just like <laughs> great. A great program. It's like too, man. Yeah, yeah, he's like five x like yeah. mo what most people are doing, and so yeah. it's. Um, I didn't even know what this this tree sitter was. Yeah, uh, I but it's like a, it's a syntax like tree part like a generic sort of like tree parsing tool, yeah. and then the Go tree tree sitter is basically Golang bindings on top of that, and there are other language bindings as well. So if you wanted to write your own version of this in a different language, like Rust or something, for example, there is. A Rust library that binds to tree sitter as well. Um, so I think this is uh, super awesome to see this kind of work in the space. Uh, oftentimes, so much of security research is just like regex <laughs> instead yeah, of actual seriously. parsing and like technical, like low level type stuff. So it's really, really cool to see something like this come out. And uh, I think it's a great, uh, a great example case if you want to just like read through the code and see how it works uh, about how something like this, you might be able to make a different version of it or or another version of it. Yeah, for sure. All right, man. We made it. We made it through the news. Um, just take a breath. <laughs> All Oxygenate right. my brain again. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Um, so what I was hoping to do today with the direction for the pod is just kind of go through a bunch of client side related mm -hmm. stuff. Um, yeah, it's all client side, I think. Um, that people, I feel like people should know about that are kind of at the fringe of stuff or, or specifically stuff that I've learned at live hacking events, um, just from other like really crazy good researchers. Um, so, uh, let's, let's kind of hit this list. The first one, actually, we talked about this a little yeah. bit before, um, personally, but, uh, there's this function in JavaScript called import, right? And this allows you to import, um, well, essentially, it's a it's a module import functionality for uh, ECMAScript, and it it, it kind of blows the mind how it actually works in the browser because I, I didn't really think that would, yeah, like yeah. I, I remember when you first showed me this, and I was like, "Are you sure that this works?" Like I, I had I had you actually walk me through like showing me that it, it was actually functioning in the browser because I was a hundred percent sure this was a Node.js thing yeah. and that this was not going to be possible in just like standard JavaScript within the browser and it it works. I mean, it's so weird. It's the strangest functionality that that I've seen. Like it's extremely counterintuitive because you would expect that this type of stuff just wouldn't exist in standard JavaScript for security reasons, uh, and yet it does. Yeah, I feel like but I learned about this originally from File Descriptor because whenever like I met File Descriptor at a live hacking event a long time ago, and uh, and whenever I had like a weird JavaScript situation, I would just be like I would just ping him and and we'd get on a call and he'd like figure it out for me, and I was like oh this is great. So I saw him use this once when we were talking about code golf, right? Like how to minimize the amount of code that you have and accomplish a goal. And he used this to like import from an external, you know, uh, script. And I was like, oh, this is pretty sick. Um, yeah. And yeah, it, it saved my butt a couple times because a lot of times you, you know, even if you can get an alert to pop, if you have a um, sort of a length limit on uh, your your input for a, an XSS, it's not actually possible for you to get, um, or I guess. I won't say it's not possible. Let me let me let me retract that statement because it's been <laughs> proven time and time again that you can do a lot of crazy stuff. But um, a lot of times you have to, you, they, you're asked to prove arbitrary JavaScript execution, um, normally by importing a, a script or or show that you can execute long form JavaScript for an exploit, right? Um, yeah. And this is a really cool tool for that. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to make sure the folks knew about this because uh, I, I think I kind of took this for granted working with File Descriptor. And I think most of the people that I've showed it to have actually been like, wait, what? Yeah, yeah, super crazy. And also, if, if you actually go into the, the Mozilla uh, docs, the reference yeah. docs about this, the MDM web, web docs, 
that talk about this, there's a specific warning that they call out that says, warning, do not export a function called then from a module because this will cause the module to behave differently when it's imported dynamically than when it's imported statically. And Here. so I think this is a really interesting attack scenario where it's it's a bit of an edge case, but if you're able to do some sort of a file write or something like that where yeah. you can then get to an import, if the code, say you have like some dynamic import that's importing from a file that you can then control, but it's calling .ven on it, just like how with um, deserialization bugs, where mm. there's like a function that's going to be called implicitly just by how, how it's functioning, you can hijack that by defining a then function in your module that's going to be exported and then it'll run when it's imported on the site. Yeah, no, that that's that's really cool. I didn't I, I didn't see that. I didn't scroll down there to see that. So that that's definitely another interesting attack vector. Um, but yeah, no, uh, this is this is really sweet and it does allow my my XSS payloads to get a little shorter, which I appreciate because <laughs> it's actually not very trivial to get XSS. Like for yeah. example, if you have if you have an image tag or an SVG tag um xss it's not trivial to get a script imported in that scenario because yeah. you can't just use script source right um no. that doesn't work after the dom has already been loaded um and so yeah this is a cool tool for getting you there yeah yeah and i think it still adheres to csp and stuff right like there's still yeah, it does yeah, there are still like limitations and stuff that that it's not like just a complete like bypass of the security features but it's just another way to basically get your javascript into the page yeah all right, cool. Um, next one was, and this is one we've talked about before, yep. but um, Gareth Hayes' book, JavaScript for Hackers. I, I kind of took a read through it and noted down some cool sections. Um, and I just gonna was just going to shout out a couple of these. Let me pull up the book here. Um, yeah. Okay, so the first section that I, I thought was really interesting was he, he talks about how to um, do how to uh, the various different types of JS comments that there are. And there are way more than I, than I thought. The particularly interesting one was that sort of a legacy piece from before the browsers actually used, um, before they used JavaScript, you know, all of the browsers used JavaScript, there was sort of a legacy implementation of where you can use an HTML comment inside of JavaScript as a comment, which I yeah. totally didn't know. Definitely didn't know about this. And just generally speaking, this book is like an insane resource. It, yeah. It's kind of the pinnacle of the kind of stuff that we're talking about in terms of documenting strange behaviors yeah. that yeah. you can, that aren't necessarily vulnerabilities by themselves, but you can often tie these behaviors together to exploit different scenarios easier or more effectively. And it's $20 on LeanPub. Yeah. So that's like not even that's like a fraction of at one XSS <laughs> that you could definitely get with this book. <laughs> so yeah. uh, definitely, I would recommend investing in it and buying it and giving it a, a thorough read and take some notes in your notes.txt file <laughs> as an editor <laughs> would do. <laughs> Right, and right. Uh, and definitely take take some take some learnings from this because there's so many interesting weird behaviors that the browser does to accommodate for like old legacy uh, old shit. browsers yeah. or legacy behavior and that kind of stuff to make stuff work across like new old stuff work in new browsers that you can then exploit to your advantage. Yeah, for sure. And and so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you scroll to page 66 in the in the um, in the book. Um, and then he also mentions, so there's, there's four types of, of comments he mentions in here, and I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna read them all, read them all out because, uh, you know, I want, uh, you guys got to go buy the book, but the, the last one there, num number four in that list, I, I couldn't get that one to work. So I thought that one was a little bit interesting. Yeah. I feel it. I'm going to double check because that looks like it's a non ASCII character. It could be, I copied it, but it, it. I don't know. I couldn't get it to work, but I will. I will tell them about the the first one on the list. Another. Um, so I already mentioned that you can use an HTML comment inside of JS. Uh, JS. But also, there's another comment which is hashtag bang, which I did not know about. Um, and that uh. only he says the first example will only work if it's the first JavaScript statement. If it appears elsewhere, a syntax error will be raised. Um, and so I I just didn't know about that. And I think that's another really cool. Um, edge case that you can use to to comment some stuff out in the beginning of a of a javascript block yeah okay so yes i did check 
that character it looks like a like a standard character it's actually a unicode character it's the en dash so on mac it's like if you do option that it's like the long like the long dash you know what i mean like okay. uh sometimes I, dude, it gets auto corrected if you type thing man yeah I, like sometimes if you do a dash dash it'll get converted into an en dash where it's like yeah. a lo- it's like a long dash it's really more of a writing formality than anything yeah um but uh yeah that's super super interesting I, again i wonder if this is like backwards compatibility type stuff where yeah. the two dashes it's like equivalent to the, the en dash and then yeah yeah nice yeah i i think i think there might be that might have just gotten extended to a that should have, might should have been two dashes because it that's the end of the HTML oh yeah script. maybe it's a typo in the book yeah. and, and we said we weren't going to mention it but sorry sorry Gareth now we're now we're just you know but yeah apparently you know there's a way for you to actually comment out a whole line with the dash with the you know closing HTML um, comment um, you know but yeah. That, that that seems a little bit weird. I'm gonna have to suss that out a little bit more. I tried it before. I it might have been it might be something that the browsers have stopped implementing um as a as a security measure or not. But um still yeah. a couple really cool pieces in here. Um uh you know how to do how to smuggle in JavaScript comments because uh, those can be useful in, in JavaScript scenarios where you're injecting directly into a JavaScript block and you've got to comment out the rest of the um the block. Yeah, a little bit of a side tangent here. Uh, at the Meta event, so Meta has this thing called Hermes. Okay. Uh, it's it's a JavaScript engine that they wrote, uh, and it's super super interesting. It's similar to V8 in in like what it does, but uh, there's a whole community of researchers who only focus on testing and finding bugs in Hermes, just no like way. how there is really? for V8 as well. How there's like you know Chrome hackers or whatever, like people who find JavaScript engine bugs, yeah. and it's the same thing for Hermes. And this type of weird syntax stuff makes me wonder like where that parsing is actually happening within a JavaScript engine yeah. and sort of like how that functionality is working and whether or not you could actually pinpoint within the engine these types of edge cases for how the how the engine is identifying a comment and like what qualifies as a comment and then use that to your advantage to find either new exploit exploitation cases or other ed- exploitation cases that may not even be mentioned here. Yeah, dude. I, I have endless respect for those people that just like pick this one project or like this one focus and then just like, just, like smack so it into the ground, <laughs> yeah. you know, like that's it's it takes so much dedication and, and you know, you, the knowledge does compound, though. So it kind of makes sense why they would yeah. want to keep that snowball rolling of knowledge yeah, on for that sure. specific project. And yeah. and while you were talking about that, I actually did go back uh, and, you know. I was not able to reproduce that before because it got normalized into the um, uh, the elongated uh, dash, like you said. Yeah, the en but, dash. The en dash, but actually, if you put two dashes, like it, I think that's what it should be, um, uh, that becomes the closing HTML comment, and that actually does work as a comment in okay. in JavaScript. So. Okay, I'll, we might I'll, have to tell Gareth because yeah, he'll we'll need to, to update his Gareth. book. That he has a little typo in there from he probably typed it on a on a Mac or something, and it yeah. <laughs> it got auto corrected. Well, you know, these are just the secrets you get for listening to Critical Thinking uh, podcast. Yeah. You know, even even Gareth's book, we're hacking it. <laughs> yeah, now you know. <laughs> um, all right, so next one was okay. Dude, this one's actually really interesting. Um, this is another one that I just kind of took for granted. I think just because of like something I saw early on in my bug bounty experience. But um, this is regarding a specific context where you are injecting into. Uh, oftentimes, what it ends up being is a JavaScript variable. Okay, so you know you're inside a script tag, you're in a JavaScript variable, and your input is going inside of that variable. Right now, that yep. variable is being defined with either single or double quotes per JavaScript. Yep. It could be a templating string as well, but that's rare. Um, and uh, if you're inside that, um, you know you the initial instinct would be to try to use double quotes or single quotes to escape that variable and get an XSS. You know, just by injecting JavaScript in there. Um, and then, you know, the second sort of route, if that fails, would be to try to do something funky with like backslashes, right? And escaping, you know, the end of that um, that double quote or the single quote and seeing if you can link it together with another injection point to kind of get an XSS. Um, but yep. an- another one that I feel like people miss a decent bit is you have to still sanitize the HTML elements because, yeah. um, because you know, at the end of the day, you're inside of a script tag. And the only way that the browser is going to know that that script tag is going to end is like with an actual, you know, 
back, you know, yeah. less than slash script, you know, end tag. And yeah. so if you do that inside of the JavaScript context, you it's going to just cut off the rest of the JavaScript and then you yeah. have HTML injection and you can get XSS from there. So, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, there's nothing in the browser spec or anywhere that states that you have to have valid JavaScript in your script tags. Right. Like you yeah. can have like an open quote that never ends. Right. And then you just close it with a script tag, right? And yeah. so in that same sense, like if you have something that's being injected directly into a string, you don't have to end that string. You could just close the script tag and mm -hmm. keep like, put elements in the page. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, get XSS via like, you know, an, an on click or an on hover right. or an on load right. event handler. Which is going to have a diff different CSP as well because the CSP for script source is not the same as, you know, like including other, for example, an import, right? Like that's going to yeah. go to a different CSP. Yeah, that is a little bit tricky though. If you have a non-spaced uh, script tag and that, that script has a nonce on it, right? If you close off that script yep. tag, then you're not going to be able to smuggle your your you know payload inside of that scripted nonce. So True. see CSP, it, it's kind of a it's kind of a double edged sword sometimes with that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if maybe that could that that's something that we could talk about in the future is uh, it, there's the CSP evaluator tool that that Google made that's mm -hmm. and that's pretty good. Um, you can basically just paste the CSP in there. We'll we'll link it, but you just paste like a CSP uh, full like directive in there, and it'll tell you like if it's vulnerable to things, they have a list of known uh, domains and like paths that have, um, what, what, what is it? The like JS, uh, the callbacks, basically the are, JSON are P endpoints. I'm not, I'm not sure what you're talking about. C yeah. So Google has the, the CSP uh, evaluator, oh, CSP yeah, evaluator yeah, yeah. dot with Google. Right. And if you put a whole content security, security policy string in there, it will check it and it'll tell you whether or not each part of it is safe and whether or not there are certain bypasses. So certain domains like youtube.com and stuff, they have um, alert, like poppable, basically like mm -hmm. gadgets that you can exploit that still will, uh, they'll still adhere to the CSP, yeah. but you can use them to get an XSS. And I'm wondering if there's anything that goes beyond that that does more of a deep dive in terms of like uh, not necessarily a problem with the CSP, but ways that you could work within the CSP mm. outside of like, you know, just, Oh, this domain, you could use this domain as a gadget to then pop an XSS. Maybe you could all, you could also say, Oh, you would have to put something within a script tag in order to adhere to this nonce that's in the CSP or something like that. Yeah, dude. And I don't think I've seen any tool like that. CSP is like, a whole episode of its, of its own probably <laughs> actually originally had it in this episode to talk about some stuff about csp and cores and i was like uh you know especially after all the news we added there's just no way we're gonna get to any of that today yeah um, yeah so yeah and for what it's worth the, the csp evaluator is based on research that was done in 2016 so it's been almost oh my god it's getting we're getting old dude it's been almost 10 years yeah. Yeah. oh my <laughs> uh, gosh <laughs> So, wow, dude. you know, there's there's definitely been some bypasses and stuff that are not going to be in that list um, and some other like confounding factors that are there that are not going to be in that list yeah. that are worth looking at. So I don't think the CSP evaluator, evaluator is the sort of end all be all uh, when you're looking at a CSP and there are going to be some other sort of knowledge things that you're going to want to keep in mind when you're looking at a CSP that won't get called out by the evaluator. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it... it like I feel like those endpoints, though, like you were saying before, the JSON PM points in particular. Like I've thought about reporting endpoints where you can, like, for example, you can smuggle in a um, a semicolon or like a comma or something that will allow you to actually inject um, uh, arbitrary JS code into the callback parameter for those JSON P endpoints. I, yep. I totally feel like that's a bug, especially for big <laughs> companies where it's like you know you're gonna you're going to have other people approving your site as a as a CSP, you know, bypass, right? right? As a as a uh, as an allowed site within CSP, like you yeah. got to use that that power responsibly. Um right. and you know, make sure you're taking care of those um those JSONP endpoints and there's just there's just a, you know, a lot of like you mentioned there's a lot of gadgets out there that'll still allow you to just bypass it yeah. unfortunately. And again, I think this is one of those those artifacts of like legacy support where they're now in a place where if they were to change how that 
endpoint works for like a JSON P endpoint, then mm -hmm. stuff that's using it in the past may break because they're using it incorrectly. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so now it's like vulnerable by design, but yeah. they can't fix it. Yeah. Because they can't migrate people away from it because it's like hard coded and other yeah, people's websites. Yeah, but who's using a semicolon in their JSON callback? <laughs> you know, like nobody's. Hey man, I've seen that. a lot of really sketchy, a lot of really sketchy engineer behavior. So Dude, if they I, engineered I put nothing it like past that, them. <laughs> if they engineered it like that, their site deserves to break. You know? Okay. Like, yeah, it deserves to be a JSON P endpoint exactly, at that point. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay. The last thing I wanted to talk about from, from Garrett's book um, is his notes on prototype uh, pollution, um, which I feel like was sort of a a bug that I just kind of thought was like researchy, you know, oh, like man, it's, it, it's everywhere. I've seen it. I've seen it in like one live hacking event. Someone got like a crazy bug with it. Um, but um, I got another and, one you're talking about. Yeah. And, and I'm not going to go down the, the rabbit hole too much of like trying to explain all of this on the pod today but um the section of his book it was really interesting to me and actually helped me understand prototype pollution a lot more and actually gave me some good hands-on tips for scanning for it and for how to identify it within a you know an, an organization or within an application um and so i feel like this is one of the things where it, it would be a lot of work because they're kind of hard to exploit even once you find them but this could be something where you could set up a headless browser, you could put this sort of payload in the URL that he mentions in the, in the book, and then um, you know spam that across all of the websites and all of the endpoints that you know about um, you know, through recon. And, uh, and I think that would probably kick out some pretty quality results. Yeah, and for what it's worth, in, in addition, uh, Gareth works at Port Swigger, um, yeah. but the Port Swigger Web, Web Academy, Web Security mm -hmm. Academy has a, an awesome section. It's all about prototype pollution. It goes into um, both the like server side and the client side aspects of like identifying what it is, how it works, um, just like all the intricacies of like what prototype pollution is and and what's going on underneath when you're when you're sending like an underscore underscore proto underscore underscore in your payloads. And I would encourage you to just read about it because it, it's definitely one of those things that doesn't get looked at as much as it should and if you think about or you just read just read some developer code and you'll realize how many places it's possible to get prototype pollution just by writing javascript you don't have to be using like lodash and stuff mm -hmm. to get prototype pollution it definitely exists in normal developer patterns um and i think it's a lot more common than people think it's just another one of those things that kind of like an XSS, you need to kind of like spray it and see if it's going to pop anything kind of weird. And it'll be pretty noticeable if, it, if it's if it's behaving with prototype pollution um, sort of sort of behavior. There'll be indicators for sure. Yeah. And, and the server side stuff as well, like with Node, that's really interesting as well. I'm sure that's a lot you know trickier to actually exploit because you don't have the, the source code. Right. But I, I've seen at least one server side prototype pollution that just like yes is amazing <laughs> yes in, in my own job experience i've seen one not at my current company but uh yeah. but at, at, a, at a previous place i've seen a really bad server-side prototype pollution wow. and it was like a systemic uh, problem because it was like a, a a common pattern that was being used in like a lot of different places and it was just like uh honestly just like a a pitfall that the engineers thought that this was going to be fine but it, it it wasn't and the the thing with prototype pollution right especially on the server side is that you're you're polluting the object itself, right? Yeah. And so that means that every single object from then on is going to be tainted, which means that it has way widespread implications in terms of like how it can be exploited and the things that it can do. And it'll affect all parts of the application, not just one part of the application. And so the impact can be insane if you get a server-side prototype pollution. Yeah, and and I imagine that could even cause DOS as well, depending oh, on yeah. how the, the, the server-side deals with all of those you know, objects that are sort of corrupted via the, yep. by corrupting the prototype. So yep. really cool stuff there. Um, let's, since we just mentioned Port Swigger Academy, let's jump down to the DOM clobbering uh, section. This is another really cool, interesting sort of fringe bug type that I really actually, I, I was going to talk to you guys, you know, talk to you guys about it on the pod. And then I was like, oh, wait, actually, like, I feel like I don't actually fully understand how this gets exploited. Exploited and like I clicked on the Port Swigger Academy 
um, link for this, which we'll we'll put in the description. And there's just a beautiful example, Joel. Look at this code. I don't know if you got a chance to review this, but look at this code. Like I totally did not see the way that you could exploit this. Um, and so essentially what they've got going on here is that they're accessing a an arbitrary you know, window object, so window.sum object, and they're accessing an attribute of that object, some object.url, and they're setting that as the source for a, for a script tag, right? It actually doesn't seem like that far out there of a, uh, of a, of a code pattern, right? And it's saying if with just HTML injection above this, above this script, you can hijack this and, and get XSS on the page. And it does this via injecting a two A tags, um, one that has the ID sum object and another one that has the ID sub object. And then, but the second one also has the name URL and an href. And what ends right. up happening here, I did break it down in my browser. Um, when the the a those two a objects both have the same ID, they get sort of clustered into um, a right. DOM collection, and that DOM collection uh, allows you to when you, when it, they add, try to access it via window dot some object, the some object ID the ID for that DOM collection gets put into that you know window it gets defined at, at the window level within the application so now you've kind of snagged access to that variable and then the piece yeah. that i didn't know about is you could define sub attributes for that object yeah, I knew you with could, the name I, yeah i knew you could you know hijack essentially a variable in the window with dom clobbering that's like traditional dom clobbering that i would think about um but then you not only can you do that but you can also at snag sub attributes of that um, using this, uh, using the the DOM collection, and then the name attribute um, inside the second element, and then so it, it then selects that second a tag, right? Um, when it, when you use some object URL, and then it abuses the a tags dot two string. When when you do two string on an a tag, it takes the a, it, it returns the href. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like it's amazing. Again, these are like the the like the edge case, like weird stuff that you kind of wouldn't necessarily know about or even expect, right? Like the fact that you can access any element by its ID off the window object, yeah, is like already uncommon. Like super it, weird. just like it, it's super counterintuitive behavior that 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 would be a thing because it seems fairly arbitrary that just like defining an ID would make it accessible on the window. Normally you'd expect to have to do like document dot query selector or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. right. And the fact that it just implicitly does that already opens up a lot of windows for opportunity for exploitation that you may not have expected originally where you, you can now, oh, if I can just insert an HTML element or if I can put something in, a, in the URL on an HTML element that I don't, I can't escape out of it, but I can control what's in the href value or something, right? Well, now you can exploit that potentially depending on how it's being used. And those types of edge cases are really important to know. Yeah, it's just it's just amazing to me how they combined the the two string, you know, manipulation, the DOM collection thing with when you have multiple IDs um, with the same right. or multiple tags with the same ID, and then this whole weird window window dot whatever the ID is functionality here to actually trigger a, a, a very exploitable scenario in DOM clobbering. I kind of thought DOM clobbering was like mostly used for like sandbox escapes and like weird stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it actually seems like it has some very real XSS uh, implementations. Yeah, super, super strange behavior. Alrighty, man. We are at, I guess, an hour 17 here. Oh man, okay. where do we where do we want to go? Because <laughs> we got a bunch of uh, stuff left we have to talk about, but we could push some of this to the to a different episode. Yeah. Um, do you want to let? Mm, I'll I'll leave it up to you. I think we could right. talk about these last couple things, the meta tags and stuff, or we yeah. can uh, we can save it for another episode. You you are start looking like you're you're going downhill just a little <laughs> bit. Um, I, I started out strong. Uh, my jet fuel's running out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let's let's we'll we'll hit the meta and base tags, and then we'll we'll call it a wrap for this time around. And maybe we'll do another episode on like weird browser quirks because there's a lot of other stuff that we had in the doc here that I think the people need to know about. Um, but yeah, so the other thing that I, I kind of want to mention, and this was actually sparked by a bug at a live hacking event, which you probably know the one that I'm talking about. Um, but uh, a, a friend of ours uh, used a meta tag to get a really, really crazy bug at a live hacking event um, because he had an HTML injection. Um, 
And uh, and so this is something that I just kind of wanted to make sure everyone was aware of because whenever you have HTML injection, it's, it feels kind of bad, you know, if you can't get it to, to XSS. But depending on the context, there's still a lot you can do. Um, and meta and base tags are two of the primary tags that you can use to, to really do something cool with. Yeah, um, I mean, this cheat sheet is awesome. There's a ton of cheat sheets out there, but I mm. think, you know, uh, keep some of your own notes, <laughs> I think is like yeah. the, the key I would say, because like, otherwise you're gonna have a folder that's got 50 different cheat sheets that are bookmarked in it. And when you're trying to think of that one thing, you're gonna have to click through all of them to find them. Um, yeah. but yeah, this is really, really interesting. I didn't actually, um, I don't really fid fiddle with meta tags very much. And I think it's kind of underrated. I like early on, like way back in the day, like meta tags used to be like a much easier exploit scenario where mm -hmm. you could just like set like base URLs or something like that, that would right. allow you to exploit them. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much that's still possible. Yeah. Not, so the, some of the functionality, cause you used to be able to, I think trigger XSS via, um, via a meta tag. And, right. um, according to this cheat sheet, it's still possible using a data URI. This was not something I got to test before, um, the episode. It says here that it only works in Safari. So I can't test it right now. Joel, if you, I don't know if you got, second most popular browser. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Seriously. If, if you've got your, you know, I don't know if you're on your Mac right now, but if you want to just throw that little, um, you know, data scheme in, in, into the in, to Safari and see if it works. Then go for it. But um, but Meta essentially has a, a bunch of functionality, and one of the cool attributes of it is this HTTP equiv attribute. And originally, it was designed to allow you to essentially set HTTP headers inside of the the page like sort of, I guess, sort of retroactively because it's like you've already loaded the body of the request. Um, and I feel like there's a lot more potential for that, um, you know, than, than is possible right now. But um, if, you, if you look at this, here, let's see if I can pull up this uh, picture that I had in the, in the doc, the current values that are accessible for that are content security policy, content type, default style, and refresh. And each one of those are all like, pretty freaking interesting, I think. Because um, with content security policy, you can trigger a content security policy to execute um, inside the browser using using that meta tag. We see that pretty often. That's, that's pretty common. Um, but setting the content type, this includes encoding. That, that's another thing that I hadn't really thought about before researching for this episode is like, you may be able to use the meta tag to change the encoding for the content body and trigger some XSS further down in the page um, if you've got mm. some weird injection points. So that's one that Super I hadn't really thought about. Yeah, so I just tested this on on Safari. Yeah. Um, let's see, what version? The latest Safari version, 16.5.1. And what it does, it throws an error. So I don't know mm -hmm. if it's actually exploitable or maybe you okay. might need to do some modifications, but it does say not allowed to navigate top frame to data URL, yeah. data colon text HTML. So yeah. it does like it's parsing it and it's like skipping over that zero, uh, zero semicolon thing. Yeah. Uh, and it does seem to like try to do it, but maybe this is something that they added recently um, as, as a fix. Um, Cause I yeah. know that like some of the things that are in this cheat sheet are definitely for older versions. Like it talks about like, from 65, which is probably that's way out there. Five five plus years old, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And and so like it said, there used to be a set cookie instruction, which is like, oh my gosh, that would be lit. Uh, the you good know? old days. That's so fun. <laughs> but the way that I see meta tags used most most um, commonly now for exploitation purposes is, is for this content security policy stuff, and then also primarily for this redirection um, piece, right? Because like think about it, it's very hard to get. Actually, I can't even really think of another way to ex to redirect a page with no user interaction with with just html without using javascript right yeah and, and, so, and for what it's worth that's that mm -hmm. works on, on safari at least I, I just tested that like the, the meta redirect through oh, yeah. the lang language tag like that works totally fine yeah um, for, but for sure. redirecting it to a data url it, it doesn't want to do yeah, so you've definitely got that in your pocket. And this can be useful in a bunch of different scenarios. Um, it can be useful on embedded devices. It can be useful um, in inside of headless browsers. Um, and so uh, the open redirect piece, you know, by the meta tag is really cool. And I would love to see some research surrounding um, the content type piece. 
um, because I feel like there's definitely some interesting functionality there. I was trying to think about the default style piece. Um, I, I couldn't really come up with anything, but it seems weird to me. So yeah, so I mean, there's always the the scenario that always comes to mind with like style stuff for me is the key like the key press uh, like sniffing mm, where yeah. I, I think that's always been like a really solid attack scenario where if you can eject styles like you can either you can create a really plausible phishing scenario because you're on an SSL signed website that's looks completely different and might have different different content and stuff, uh, but you can also do like Key, like key input like changes where you like hit a background like a background url or something and i think it still goes through some sort of csp right mm. um but you know depending on the scenario you can sniff key binds within the website purely through css yeah which is just like insane <laughs> yeah I, I love i love that bug so much there's yeah. been some really cool stuff with that and i'm actually i'm looking at because like w3 schools is a great resource and i i use them all the time for yeah for for you know this sort of thing but oh yeah there's also whoa i'm not i'm just computer's thinking about it right freaking out oh okay oh. you good can you hear me yeah i'm back sorry it like okay. totally went crazy for just a second okay cool um yeah so i I'm, i was just thinking about this right now like as we were talking about css mm. a couple years ago there was a pro a, a project that came out called doom nukem css and it's a full implementation of Doom that's written in HTML and CSS. No way. <laughs> and maybe it uses TypeScript too. I don't actually, I don't actually know. But I'm pretty. I'm, if I recall correctly, I could have sworn it was like all CSS, which is like <laughs> the craziest thing. Well, but it looks yeah. like there's a decent amount of TypeScript in here. I might be wrong. Well, Gar you know, Gareth Hayes. We, you know, we mentioned him a couple times on this um, uh, on this episode. His personal website, if you go to his Twitter profile and you click his bio link, that's like a CSS based, like <laughs> freaking interactive game masterpiece of a website. And it's just kind of like an ongoing project for him. And I'm like, wow, that's like such a cool hobbyist activity of like just mastering CSS stuff. And he and he tweets about like CSS related quirks all the time, which I think is really helpful as well. Yeah, what is it? GarethHayes.co.uk. Yeah, check it out. Yeah. Sure. Oh man, this is while, while you're checking it out. <laughs> yes, I wanted to no, mention. this is exactly what I was thinking of actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and <laughs> yes. So there's some really crazy stuff you can do with CSS, um, with just pure CSS, which is nuts. But um, I what I was going to say before my computer started losing its mind um, was that uh, I went to W3 Schools and I was. It says that there's only four attributes that can go inside of, or values that can go inside of the HTTP equiv. Um, header, or I mean, uh, ad, uh, HTML attribute. Um, but actually, I'm looking at some other stuff, and I think there's more. So, like, mm -hmm. th uh, I've seen other references to window.target and content encoding as well. So, I'm actually, after this episode, I'm going to go try to suss that out because um, I think there might be some other things we can put in HTTP equiv that could really, really mess with the, you know, the DOM um, that's being loaded up. So, Definitely yeah. some cool stuff. I also to wonder if there. there's like undocumented features and st like functionality because I feel like a yeah. lot of browsers will create just like they'll create weird edge cases with like that they use internally mm -hmm. um, that are only really designed to be used by them mm -hmm. that may not adhere directly to the HTML spec or what the public spec says should be possible but is actually still possible. And you know, it's important to remember that. Just because the spec says that it should be this way doesn't mean that it's actually implemented that way. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely some some I'm looking through it right now. There's some weird, some weird stuff there. So I'm gonna check that out afterwards. Um, but for for those of you listening right now, what we can what we can confirm right here is it's it is helpful for exploitation in a content security policy scenario if you want to make the content security policy stricter to lock out, like for example, a um like, for example, if they're loading up a, a JS library that does purification or something like that, <clears throat> then it's helpful there. And then it's also possible to use it for a, a no additional click redirect if you have an HTML injection. So that's helpful as well. Yeah, yeah super cool. Um, so the other thing that we were going to talk about here was the base tags. Um, and base tags, this is something that that I didn't know about till recently. I think these have to be in inside the head Um uh, sort of section w within the yeah. browser um, or within the DOM. So I'm not sure how often we're getting injections up in there. Um, but 
yeah, there's some really cool stuff you can do with this. Um, essentially, it allows you to s turn relative URLs into, uh, you know, fully qualified URLs with your domain, which is super helpful for, um, you know, hijacking stuff further down in the flow of the page uh, and, and maybe even bypassing CSP in some scenarios. Um, so yeah. I guess some, I don't know if you can nonce an external import, but um, yeah, that would be, that would be helpful in that scenario. Yeah, I'm just testing this one on Safari as well, just to double check. Cause I'm pretty sure you're right that it has to be I'm almost certain it has to be in the in the head. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think it has to be. Um uh but yeah, I, I didn't know about this and this is just another really cool piece that you can you can use in an HTML <laughs> no, injection. It doesn't. It doesn't have to be in the head. What? Maybe Wait. Safari's doing yeah. something weird. Uh yeah, this could be something that Safari's doing doing weird. Yeah. But I did just double check, and in my body element, I put a base href and a script tag, and it is trying to load it from the base URL. Wow, that's in the body tag. That, I stand corrected, man. Yeah, this so, this has a lot of power. This element, um, and HTML, like we mentioned, HTML injections can be kind of tricky. But this is definitely something that you can use to kind of try to turn the tides in your favor. Headers, Chrome is doing it too. I've nerd sniped. Joel is just like staring <laughs> wide eyed at his at his computer uh, right now. Yeah, like, no, Chrome does it too. So yeah, if you put the base tag it, maybe even I'm just in the body, that up. yeah, dude, I I could have sworn that it was a head only thing. Yeah, but Very okay, cool. yeah. So a base uh, base tag anywhere um, will change uh, where it tries to load from, even if it's in the body. Very solid, man. Yeah, yep. I think that's all I've got for base base stuff. Um, Dude, we skipped over so much. <laughs> We're gonna, yeah, we have I'm a whole gonna, second episode yeah, worth of, worth of prepped, content that we didn't even talk about. We've already prepped for another episode. I'm just going to copy this over into the other doc because this is, yeah, a lot of stuff. But anything else you want to add before we wrap this one up? Uh, no, I think that was it. I love how this is like one of our longest episodes and it was like on a ho on a U.S. holiday and after you drove, you know, just flew back from Korea. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, another another banger. But yeah, no, thank you for uh, putting together all these links because there's no way I would have been able to, to find all this stuff. And um, I've got some notes I need to take now, I think, uh, yeah, just for, for my sure. own personal, good, personal stuff. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say good luck to our producer trying to fit all this in the episode <laughs> description. But there's like 50 bajillion links, but all right, cool. That's a wrap. Yeah. Awesome. All right, yeah. Catch you later. Sweet. Peace. <laughs> I don't know. I don't so we, we after the episode ended, we just went and kind of tried to suss out that base thing a little bit more about the, uh, you know, being able to put the base tag in the body. And I swear that was not something that used to be the case. Yeah. Uh, but it, it says specifically in the HTML spec that it has to be in the head head tag, inside the head tag. And it works perfectly fine in the body tag in lots of browsers. So I'd, I've never seen this documented before. And I think this has some pretty bad XSS implications. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're looking at the HTML spec at directly, and it says that the context in which a base element can be used is within a head element containing no other base elements. And if you put a base element in a body, it works. It still works. Uh, the only real caveat that I've seen the, through the limited testing that we just did is that if there's a base element in the head already, the one in the body will not override it, which right. is expected. Yeah. But it shouldn't be possible that you put one in the body and it works. It should completely ignore it unless it's in the head, uh, yeah. which is super wild because that do, you can inject those. So yeah, yeah. we got to do more live testing on the pod. Just find <laughs> weird shit like this. All right, cool. All right, that's a wrap. Yeah, yeah. Catch you. Right. Catch you the next week. Alrighty. After that data packed episode, I have one measly request for you at the end of this episode. And that is for you to head over to ctbb.show and subscribe to our newsletter. We're trying to grow the content over there. Jesse Rivera is putting out some awesome blogcast summaries of the episodes. You don't want to miss out on those. Um, so yeah, ctbb.show. Head over there, subscribe. Thanks.